Dr. Gilbert Lenz, what an honor and privilege to have you in my studio with me talking about something that is so important and very dear to my heart, menopause and how to manage it and ageism and all these things. And being 58, that is very much a topical thing that's in my life. And so many people talk about this. So I don't have to tell you because this is why you've no. written the book. I've been so. spending a lot of time talking about this and thinking about it and reading yeah. about it and writing about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's your life. So it's great to have an expert to help disseminate some of the mistruths and myths and just the whole bad way that this whole thing has been handled as though there's something wrong with you. But welcome. Let me hand over to you. Can you just introduce yourself a little bit to my listeners? They've heard your bio, but it's always great to hear a little bit of it insight yeah. from you. Well, thank you for having me, Caroline. What's the quick and easy way to do this? I am a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. I've been in practice in Beverly Hills for more than 20 years. I'm also board certified in integrative and holistic medicine. And I, I have that. training specifically in Ayurveda in the ancient healing system of India, the Indian subcontinent. So I think, I think the thing for me is that I have sort of a deeper and a wider toolkit. I practice straight up conventional Beverly Hills gynecology. I actually just retired from delivering babies six months ago. So oh, I delivered wow. for, yeah, yeah, thousands of babies. Yeah, I know, really amazing. And I'm only doing gynecology now. But the thing is that despite my prescription pad and my surgeries and all the other things that I do that are conventional, I have sort of a, a wider, deeper perspective. And I think that that has really informed the way I look at all of the, the problems and all of the things that come my way. And I, I think everything, look, with all due respect to conventional Western medicine, of which I'm a participant and a proponent, exactly. you know, everything is a problem solution. And menopause is a really interesting area, like you said, because it's a normal physiologic event. It is exactly. the puberty of midlife is the way I like to call it. And I, like I think, yeah, and I think, but I think the reason I say that is that to normalize it, everybody understands what I mean when I say that. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. Say Rather that again, than, just for the listeners that maybe have missed that. The puberty of midlife. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> you know? Such like, another way of looking at it. Yeah. it's a, it, Look, if you're lucky enough to be around at this point in our lives, like then you're going to go through menopause. It doesn't need to be viewed as some kind of a curse. You know, that's a narrative yeah. that we are free to dismiss, actually, if we do not want to participate in that. But then how do you do so? That, that becomes the question, right? Um, yeah. I'm so pleased that you've you know launched off like that because you know media, TV shows, it's always this oh that time of our life it's so terrible, but it's been one of the best times of my life. But that's because I've handled it properly because I had knowledge and I have OBGY friends and I know about people like yourself and I read the material. But a lot of women aren't in my position, and no, it, it shocks true. me how many people will come up to me at a conference or send us messages about you know mental health and menopause and. You know, just all the things and like it's this terrible thing, but it's not. It's an amazing time of your life if it's managed properly. So I know you share that view and that's why I was very pleased to interview you. So tell us why it's not such a... Now maybe we should start... You, you're, uh, let's, let's talk about depathologizing menopause first. Depathologizing is great, a great way because we pathologize everything. We pathologize childhood. We pathologize mental health when it, these are life experiences. So I'd, right. I'd love to start there. And definitely want to touch on the ageism thing as well. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's a lot of it. I think I mm -hmm. think it's a convergence of a lot of third rail topics that are scary to people and understandable. So I want to be really clear. You know, I don't want people to feel like they're not allowed to have whatever feelings they have around menopause. Absolutely. Because it is a massive shift and a massive change. And much like puberty, it really can be very discombobulating, right? It's like, you think you know who you are. And and especially for people who live in their bodies the way women during their menstrual life do. You know, we're so accustomed to identifying ourselves with our bodily functions. Yeah. And when those start to get disrupted, that's when people start to encounter big concerns, right? And I always bring that word up specifically disruption, because to me, if you're feeling stuff and it's not really bothering you, let me help you understand what's part of physiologic events, what's part of a change, and what is something that maybe we should be looking more deeply at? Like, are you having hot flashes because you actually have a thyroid problem? Or are you, you know, it's like, let's make sure we're not, not addressing something important. But I want to also address the, the emotional and psychological aspects of it, because 
people feel different and they, if they can't talk about it, and this is where we get into the Mm. isms, right? If people are afraid to bring up their age because they're afraid of ageism and misogyny plus ageism Mm. is really intense. Mm -hmm. It's really intense. Instead of people looking at women our age and saying, look at them. They've all this accumulated knowledge and wisdom. They really have it going on. They have a lot of experience. They have a lot to offer we get told that we're about to disappear, that we're invisible, we're not viable, we're not sexy. I, whatever it is, you name it, we've all heard it. Now, obviously, you and I are defying those those narratives for a number of reasons that you and I could probably have a very long conversation I'm about, sure. <laughs> right? Because yeah. some of it's a personality style, you know, and some of it's luck, some of it's privilege. Mm-hmm. But if if we're getting that story from the outside, and now we're feeling from the inside really out of control and out of our bodies, we're going to be upset and worried and scared. And now you're hearing that it's it's a mixed bag out there, Caroline, Mm -hmm. because I think the fact that we're talking about menopause so much more now is so helpful. Yeah, it's so good. Just to say the word. But then it turns into like the 34 symptoms that it, you know, as if yeah. it's a disease that we have to check box and now we have to be running for a solution. I, 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 while I do offer a lot of solutions and not a one size fits all solution, that's the most important thing. Very important. I want to be clear, like you said, it's not a pathology, it's not a disease. Mm-hmm. So if we enter into it with education and understanding of what maybe we can expect, and then a wide variety of options to live through, thrive, and come out the other side of it, really feeling like you said your best. It's a completely different experience, you know? Oh, I can't agree more. It's, it's the pathologizing side is really unfortunate. And we've, you know, we've just become a pathologizing society, as I mentioned already, pathologizing childhood, pathologizing adverse experiences that are normal responses to life. And then pathologizing these normal passages of life. And Instead of educating, it's pathologizing. And so right, often, as you say, right. by the you know, patriarchal system and, I mean, just the recent court rulings and, you know, just it's mm. all these things that are, are, the, are so wrong. So yeah. what is a, before we go into things like eating and that kind of stuff, I'd, I want to, I like your, let's re-talk to the question you have here that rethink stigmas about mental, menopause and embrace it as a time of joy and growth. How can we do that? And practically, how can we do that? I mean, I know I have my own experience. And I'm sure you have your own experience because you have so much knowledge in the area. But how can we rethink this now that we've said pathologizing is not the answer? Now you've said it's right. it's a normal passage of life, which right. we know, but you know, there's a disconnect between pathologizing and normal passage of life. How can we rethink it for the women that are listening today? What can they do? Well, I think, again, saying things out loud so that people don't feel alone. So they don't think that something is wrong with them and now they're suffering in silence. They're not, they're not feeling well. They're not feeling like themselves. Something is different. Something is off. And they're not getting any validation that like that this is a thing that people go through. So I do think saying the word out loud, creating communal spaces for us to have conversations about what we're going through and supporting each other is, is a huge part of it. And then having specific knowledge and education around, like I said, what are the what are the stages? What are the definitions even? People don't even know what it is. What are the yeah. options that are available to us to help us feel better, depending on what the issue is? Is it sleep? Is it brain fog? Is it hot flashes? Is it vaginal dryness? Is it changes in sexuality? Is it weight gain? You know what there's, because you could really get into the weeds and you and I could spend a lot of time on all of these things, but educating ourselves about what what are the parts of this that are going to change? Again, then we're approaching things without fear. We're curious. So to me, this is just adopting an attitude of curiosity and openness about everything. That is just something that I do. That's the way, do I always do that all day, every day? Of course not. I'm a human being. I have moods. <laughs> Sometimes <Yeah. laughs> I'm not, I'm not having it and I'm not enjoying it. You know, yeah. you don't have to love it all. But if you're curious and it's a journey and you're learning and you do think there's going to be something on the other end, even if it's just a tool that you never heard of to help you feel better, then how, to me, that is the definition of joy. I am Discovery is joyful for me. I think the other thing is figuring out what is joyful for you, because for a lot of people in this age group, we're facing big changes in our family structures, mm-hmm. in our life structures. Maybe we have kids and they're leaving. Maybe we never had kids and we're caretaking older relatives. Maybe our career is changing, especially the last two and a half years where people's priorities have really, really changed a lot. 
you know, this can be a time of self-discovery, of letting go of some of those old images of ourselves and embracing what we as individuals want. And that's a really key feature that I hear a lot from women in this age group. They've started to center themselves in a way that they never did. Women are acculturated in general to care for other people. That is whether or not you are parenting. You, th- this is something we do. And whether it's nature or nurture, it doesn't even matter because mm-hmm. it's something that we do. And it's not something bad necessarily, mm-hmm. but we need to be directing it at ourselves. And what I yeah. hear a lot from women as they age is that they finally are directing it at themselves. Mm-hmm. They're looking at what do they like to do? What is interesting to them? What is what is their priority? Not what is the to-do list and maybe there'll be, you know, a shred of energy, uh, a whiff of something left over for us at the end of the day, which is not how that works. We end up ignoring ourselves. So these are all ways to me that I find joy being brought back into our lives and into our laps, you know. I really hear what you're saying in terms of getting knowledge, getting understanding. It's that fear of the unknown. So Would you mind giving, I know your book is filled with phenomenal advice and I highly recommend the book. It's (laughs) Menopause Bootcamp. I mean, it's just a great title. But would you mind just giving a brief overview of, from a medical standpoint, what is perimenopause, what is menopause, and what can can women expect? Nice, simple language, and then they can go dive in to your book. Exactly, they can read all the definitions. Exactly, and then we can start talking about what do we do about it? How do we manage it? Exactly. Okay, so here's the thing. The definition of menopause is very interesting and strange. It's actually something that you're not going to know until you're done with. So (laughs) it's 12 months consecutively without a menstrual period, without a menstrual bleed in a woman over age of 45 for no other medical reason. Now, of course, this excludes people who have had their uterus removed or have had chemotherapy. There's a, so we're, you know, but the basic definition is 12 months consecutively, no period. Perimenopause, I mean, perimenopause is a fluffy non-term to be perfectly honest. We use it and I use it because people are, I want to speak the same language as people, right? But perimenopause is not really meaningful. It's the time leading up to menopause. What is that? I mean, I'm a menopause yeah. expert, so that could be your whole life. <laughs> if, I, if my point of reference is, in, you know, you know, menopause is the event in your life, then everything leading up to that is perimenopause. I think people have Again, this has been a really interesting experience where people weren't talking about this. And so using the word perimenopause was a way to validate an experience that people were having and that wasn't getting addressed appropriately. But it's not really well defined in the medical literature. So it can be anywhere from two to eight years of changes in your cycle and in your symptoms leading up to that time. I definitely have people who come in telling me that well in advance of that, 15 years in advance, they're noticing changes and they're ascribing it to perimenopause. And honestly, if you want to call perimenopause and I don't want to, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. It's a matter. It matters to me how you feel and what's going on and how can we find a way for you to be feeling more alive in your body and optimizing your health? Because that's the other thing. The other thing that I really do want to make sure people understand is that this is a hallmark event health-wise. And when we cross that threshold into menopause, we are facing different health experiences and risks. And if we are not aware of that, we're missing an opportunity to decrease risks of things like dementia and Alzheimer's. I mean, you know, right? Heart disease. These are the these are actually the top killers of of women. I'm a breast cancer survivor, by the way. So you know, I, I I'm fine. But I had it in my 40s. I had it early. And people are freaked out about breast cancer. Yeah. That's not, you know, even most breast cancer diagnoses, early breast cancer, those women are mostly going to die of heart disease, not breast cancer. So again, not to blow off breast cancer, not to blow off your mammogram. But you just give perspective. Let's get perspective on this whole thing. Because as you say, there's so much attention paid. There should be paid to breast cancer, but there's not the same level of attention paid to... It's almost like hysterical woman and whatever they go through there. And it's sort of very derogatory, not yes. everywhere, but there has been that. And it's been a lot yes. from men and yeah. that kind of thing as well, yeah. and making yeah. women almost feel guilty about it. So with those biological changes, and if you wouldn't mind just maybe explaining a few of them, comes along alongside the mental changes. So there's the yes. physical and the mind yes. changes. Yes. Would you mind just sort of talking about that as well in terms of menopause? Let's forget the perimenopause. Let's talk about the menopause talking about the actual physiologic changes that are that are just a uh, simple summary for people 
Because well, so the, the reason we're stopping having a period is that the ovarian hormone production is largely diminished. It, so we make hormones all over our body. We make sex hormones all over our body. We have receptors for their, those hormones all over our body, men and women. We make hormones in the adrenal gland. We make hormones in the ovaries. When we're talking about menopause, it's the ovarian function. So primarily estrogens, and because there's more than one, and progesterone, they're not being developed and secreted in the way that they were. And they m mostly go away at that point. So th this is where you're not having a menstrual cycle anymore. You're not having the bleed, but also the effects of those hormones on all the other tissues of your body are, are being lost on your central nervous system, on your brain, on your heart and your cardiovascular system, on the joints and the muscles, so, uh, the, the tissue, the, the vaginal tissue, the genitourinary tissue. So people will have changes in the way they are feeling in terms of feeling like maybe they're having a bladder infection or they're having inflammation. So we, we have those estrogen receptors all over our body and, and we know we're no longer are making the estrogen in the way that we were. So that's where a lot of these symptoms that we identify as really obvious, but then the other things that people may not realize are also being impacted. And this is where your long-term health consequences can come in if you're not addressing them appropriately. And that's, I think, where people get very confused because, you know, we want it to be easy and we don't want to have to think a whole lot about it. And that's unfortunately not how that works. <laughs> Think of puberty, you want to be easy, but it's such a, the 12 to 18 year lifespan is one of the most difficult in the entire human life cycle. And then we go through it a second time to use your term, you know, in, in menopause and you have to work through it. It's not an easy time. It's a period of exactly. growth. Yeah. Yeah. But it is a time where you can explore, like I said, what are your priorities and what are the ways in which you want to be living your life going forward? And I think the other thing that I try to always remind people is to be gentle with yourself and to understand that there's going to be a period of trial and error. You know, whenever I have someone who comes in and we've decided, okay, they're they're symptomatic enough that they want it, they want to start treating it, whether it's with botanicals or with hormone therapy, I tell them, look, we may hit a home run the first at bat. <laughs> yeah. But we may not. We may not. We may ground out. I can't believe I'm using a sports analogy. Like, who am I today? It's so you weird. Just very, you've just been really creative today. <laughs> it's just coming to my brain. I literally am well, not It's an working. It's working. <laughs> but it makes sense. We may, we may need to try this several times. And so, yeah. again, the, that expectation of being open, being curious, being creative, communicating. I mean, these are just life skills, really. They it's are. Nothing. They are. Yeah. Listening to what you're saying, my own experience was I had to, I had four babies and I'm a very small person and my pelvic floor collapsed and you know the story. And so it was, yeah. I probably should have had more C-sections, three natural, one C-section with a breech baby and so on. Long story short, it hit me in my mid forties. And by the late 40s, I had to do something about it because I lecture, stand, stand in front of thousands of people and on, the, on and off planes. And it was agony. It got to a point where I don't even, yeah. well, it, my, uh, the doctors didn't even know how I was doing what I was doing. Yeah. And yeah. so they had to do a whole reconstruction. But no, in, all, in all that time that I was working with two specialists, three specialists, because it was so complicated, no, not one of them told me, and they're all amazing and I love all of them. Not one of them told me that I would pick, I would be thrown into early menopause or basically surgical menopause because they had to do a full hysterectomy and ovipyrectomy and sacrocolpa pes wow. pesky, the whole lot. I mean, everything was Wait, pretty much... Wait, they took everything out and they didn't tell you you're going to be in menopause? No, not at all. Oh now, I fortunately God, have, have friends like yourself and I read and I'm in the world of knowing that what, what the brain needs and what the body needs. So I had an advantage that I could find out and realize what was happening to me. And we traveled overseas quite soon after one of the surgeries and had this most shocking night sweat. Like, oh gosh, it's, it, and it was from one day to the next. Exactly. And then, I, and then I knew what to do because I had read and I went back and found the right person that could give me BHRT and it changed my life. But yeah. that trip overseas, well, I had to live with those and I'm lecturing and I'm putting on these shirts that are drenched in minutes. <laughs> and so I'm having to change my sort of only wear black on stage. and you know, just like extra powder and I don't wow. like wearing a lot of makeup. But anyway, that's the, the point is I knew what was going on. What about the woman that don't know what's I, going right? on? Right. I knew about the, I understood the moods and because I'm in the mind game, I knew how to manage right. these things. Right, 
Right. And I knew the risk my heart was in and yes. you know, my brain yes. was at. So yes. I, as soon yes. as I got back, which was two yeah. weeks later, I was straight finding the right, you know, I found the right, I knew the right person and, and got sorted out. And it was a life-changing experience. Like every three months I go for BHRT, the pellets, uh, the little, you know, the little pellets. And it is, when I mean, they wear off, they go on those hormones. And I'm used to you, this is your field, not mine. But I can tell as a, as a patient right. that when that hormone is out of my body, I can tell from one day to the next, I can tell the difference. And we literally will book my appointments within two to three days of when, of those three month periods. And that's how dramatic it is in terms of how I function from one day to the next. So I'm not having to live with night sweats and affecting my sleep and all that kind of stuff. Right, so I'd right. say that just to give you a, an example of how important, if I didn't know, I would have been groping around in the dark, misled by the hormone studies where they were using you know, horse urine as opposed right. to botanicals. And right. knowing, not I knew doctors like you. Yeah. I wish I'd known you at that time as well. <laughs> but, you know, but, but I'm saying I was in a, a position of advantage. What about no, really, the hundreds even, of thousands it, but, of women? But this, is, but this is a really important story yeah. because even those of us who have a lot of access, who are highly educated, who are sophisticated, who have friends, the the amount of information out there is first of all it's daunting and a lot of it's really sketchy okay so so people are coming into the experience not knowing like i said not knowing what is available to them what's safe what's efficacious what's data driven what's not yeah I mean, that's why i wrote the book because yeah i think Brilliant. we are starting mm-hmm. to have a conversation and sometimes i'm i'm very my world is so menopausy, you know, that yeah. I, I forget that other people are not getting access to this information. But I saw what I was able to do in a very short period of time with a patient wasn't really enough. And I was getting, when I would go give a talk or do a TV appearance or whatever on anything else, everybody would be asking me about hormones, basically. Yeah. So I was like, okay, we need to do more time. So I started doing these in real life events, a menopause boot camp where we would do a deep dive into all the information, into you know practices, we do a fitness routine, and then we, and and the thing that was so interesting, Caroline, is that I think people came for information but left with community. I That's don't know why it didn't occur amazing. to me. It was huge because, and I'm sure you've seen this over the years too. People are getting a lot of information, but being around other people and sharing was almost as it important as the information they things. got. Exactly, you're not mm-hmm. alone. You're not scared now. You're not afraid to say the word. I mean, I can't tell you. When I first started doing them, I was, you know, asking for feedback from participants. And one person came to me at the end and said, I loved it. It was great. Could you not call it menopause boot camp? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no. That's really <laughs> I'm, cool. I'm going to call it menopause boot camp, but I hear what you're saying. And, it's and, still the, really and hard the book to got burst out of that, the menopause <laughs> boot camp. Like, it is out there. I'm saying that. So I think the thing, and I'm glad that you have found a solution that works for you. I will say the whole bioidentical thing gets people very, very upset and angry. <laughs> I'm not a fan of pellets. I'm not going to lie. I'm glad you're having a good experience. I think the pellets are interesting. I don't think they have enough data, so I don't do them. Can't say I advocate for them. I, you are a smart woman. You're working with somebody who you trust. Bioidenticals are not a medical term. I mean, truly, they are a marketing term. This is true. But I'm not here to be mad at anybody, okay? I'm exactly. here to educate. Like, this is, we are all grown ups in this room, and there's a lot of finger wagging that I see going oh, on out there. Mm-hmm. And that's just not my thing. Like, if you want finger wagging, you should go watch somebody else because that's not my deal. Like, I have an opinion. I'm happy to share it, but I'm Absolutely. not here to shame you. This is, I don't think that works. So yeah. bioidentical means that the hormone is biologically identical to hormones that your body was making in larger amounts. That's it. I think it's very descriptive and I think it's a good term to use because it sounds like what it is. Yeah, that's good. That's a very good comment that and you just made. there's not one way to mm. do it. Look, pharmaceutical companies make FDA approved bioidenticals that I use all the time. I generally speaking prefer to use transdermal. So through the skin, yeah. patches, gels, creams, they are made by the F- by FDA approved pharmaceutical. You can get it at CVS with a prescription. Progesterone, I tend to use orally. This is the way yeah. I start. Okay. I'm not going to give you that. And then there's a testosterone can be very, very helpful. Not FDA approved by the way in women. It's an off-label use. Interesting. Okay. The North American Menopause Society has a position paper on it. We have data. We know that it works for women for libido. It's also very helpful for vaginal dryness. It's ridiculous that it is not more widely available. And that's a big problem. I had a whole conversation online recently about vaginal hormones. Okay. So in general, 
we use vaginal hormones topically in the vaginal tissue to help, as I mentioned, with vaginal dryness and what we call genitourinary syndrome and menopause. So that is everything from sexual pain to just dryness that feels uncomfortable to urinary tract infections, urinary irritation. It's very, very disruptive and problematic for people. The FDA has a black box warning on vaginal estrogen saying that it can cause blood clots. It's not evidence-based. I mean, what can I say? We're in the United States. The FDA is what we got. I'm not against the FDA, but I think anybody who thinks that the FDA is like there for women, I have questions myself. Uh, I have I to have just questions. make a, no, I have questions too. I have to just comment being in the field I am in with mind, brain, body, and, you know, mental health and all, dealing with dementia and all time, all these things. There are so many studies that are not evidence-based and so many co- things, labels that are not yep. evidence-based. Yep. You know, people being yep. told ADHD yep. is genetic. It's not genetic. Yep. You know, so these are, I get, I get what you're saying and one has it's to be very, super very, careful. But the thing is our patients and our, the population is having all this thrown at them and exactly. it's very hard for them to discern yeah. who's the authority they're going to listen to. And so I wrote the book in hopes of explaining to people where, where my opinions come from what my, look, I, I use botanicals. Okay. If you get a study with 200 people using a botanical, you're like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay. You're never going to put that head to head against the women's health initiative, which is the worst study ever. Oh yeah. That was wasted money with 150,000 people. How are you going to compare? So when my colleagues Mm. are like this botanical, it's not evidence-based. Okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to people and say, you can compare them but I am going to say to you, look, if this is something that you think may work better for you, here's what I can tell you. Here's what I've seen. Here's what the data that exists says. And now I'm going to help you make a choice. I myself have not used systemic hormones because of my history of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say something for the first time publicly. I am starting to consider whether or not that is right for me, for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not going to go tell breast cancer survivors start taking hormones. It's much more complicated than that. But you're you're touching on some important stuff. I'm facing a risk of Alzheimer's that's significant. And I know, and Lisa Moscone and others. Yes, I've know, interviewed Lisa. She's and amazing. Lisa. Yeah. Incredible. But Brenton has been out there for years doing this too. Incredible. There are a lot of women in mm-hmm. the field, actually, and men who've been looking at dementia and Alzheimer's. And so you're and the link to menopause. Well, your your listeners may not know that women have two to three times the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's as their male cohorts. And we are concerned. And the evidence really points to estrogen having a major role and the loss of estrogen having a major role. So that's something that I think about. Same with heart disease. You yeah. know, before before the early 2000s, when this Women's Health Initiative came out, that was such a poorly designed study. Terrible. So many problems. Whistleblowers. This is not like a conspiracy theory, everybody. No, it's like, just a myth. You know, like read, read. There's other books out there that are not crazy outliers. Yeah. This is like just the truth. And yeah. the, the women's health world, American College of OBGYN, National North American Menopause Society, all of the most prestigious authorities that are academic have all been trying to walk this back for 20 years. They have. Because they're terrible studies. And these are studies that upended decades of data showing benefit for heart disease and Alzheimer's specifically. And you know, 20 years later, I have people coming to be scared about it. Do you, I know all the time when I say that I'm on BHRT, that the first reaction is, look, this is not exactly the same hormone, but you know, there's a lot of research confirming that this about botanicals and bioidentical is a way to go. But yes. would you mind just giving people a broad overview of the Women's Health Initiative? A yeah. lot of people have heard, a lot of people yeah. haven't, and the yeah. problems around that and you know, I know it's Ugh. a big story. I don't know if you can make a sort of some I, I can. Cliff Notes I can. version. <laughs> I'm going I'm to give you the Cliff Notes version. So this was the NIH, the National Institutes for Health, devoted a billion dollars and looked at, I think, around 120,000 women lives, okay, over a long period of time. And they were looking to sort of consolidate the data that they'd been collecting over the preceding decades on hormone therapy and menopause and health effects. The thing is that this was supposed to be designed to look at how women were making that transition in their 40s, 50s, maybe 60s, but mostly looking at the transition. And we know the average age in North America of a white woman going through menopause is 51.4, okay? So they were supposed to be looking at that. How can we affect women? How 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 are we affecting women 
by prescribing menopausal hormone therapy, which by the way, at the time, Premro was, I believe, the number one most prescribed medication in North America. Just at that wild. time, which was at when that, that time, was in the- 2002, the, that's it was right, published. 2002. Well, they, so here's what happened. In 2002, they stopped the study very suddenly saying, we're seeing increased risks of specifically cardiac events, heart attacks. Okay, well, when we looked at who was in the study, the average age was well over 60, more than 10 years past menopause, a large number, something I think like, Two thirds of the women were either overweight or obese, so they had risk factors. But yeah, they already had greedy. heart disease. How is this what applicable do we to the forty-seven-year-old who's in perimenopause? It's not, no, and not it, at all. so it just it just. But the thing is, they literally made a huge press release. It was all over every you every know, news station, Time magazine, which people remember when people read magazines, and every doctor freaked out. Yeah. Especially so that was that. And for 20 years, we have been trying to recover from this. Now, yeah. I'll tell you what I think is interesting. And I talk about this in the book. I think two things happened. One was really bad. Women got scared off of hormones. And I think it's had a negative impact on our health. Okay. For, sure. for the last 20 years. The other thing, though, is there was a huge vacuum. And this is where the compounding pharmacies and bioidentical started to come in to fill the gap. Now, some people would argue that that's been a disaster. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think we can come in and have a conversation and we can talk like grownups and we can be in the room and sit together and say, what works here? What works there? What's the yeah. best way to care for yeah. this individual person? Exactly. I, I, I think to paint the entire compounding pharmacy industry with one broad stroke and be like, they're evil. That's just, it's not accurate. I used compounding formulas before I did the pellets and they worked, but not as, not as well for me. Everybody's going to have a different Exactly, effect. but they did help. They were, they were, yes. it was an amazing first step just prior, just, yeah, just prior to the sort of disastrous change in my body. And it, but you know, that's so. You, I yeah. think we're having the conversation now because of it. Because I think, yeah, that's a good this, point. It, things are swinging back in the other direction where women are saying, I'm not having this is ridiculous. Like, why yeah. am I supposed to feel like crap, not exactly. care about my health, and fade and put away? Put myself at risk for Alzheimer's and, and heart right. disease. You know, Suzanne, as we're talking now, I'm thinking you and I, you and I need to have another conversation, get Lisa on as well. Oh, and yeah. Explore this and really yes. look at. Because we that that was very well received. And this is going to be very well received by my audience as well. But to put the two of you together and remind people and just that back to back, just the dangers of how important it is that we are teaching. Our, my I have do, three daughters, and for, I have four children. Three daughters between the age of twenty four and thirty one, and they know all this stuff. I have yeah. brought them up now with my own experience, so they're very aware and attuned. But a lot of young women aren't. And right. how they need to be proactive right. from a young right. age. And if, you know, I see my one daughter with PCOS and she's really battling with her hormones. I'm, we, we have got her under doctors. We are watching this. And, you know, so that uh, this is what we, we mustn't be frightened. Don't, you don't have to wait till you're 50 and battling or something. 51.4 exactly. and battling. Be right. proactive, which is what Lisa says. Be proactive. Right. What you're saying in your book is be proactive. Right. And I, I want people to understand. And again, hopefully they're going to buy the book and read the book. But there are tons of lifestyle fixes that are the most important things that anybody can do. You don't need to be wealthy. You don't need to have access. I mean, you know, walking is a miracle if you can just do that. So there are a lot of things that people can do that are going to be within their own area of expertise, their own control that can really have a positive impact. Because I think, again, relocating the power back within ourselves, relocating that sense of agency is super important because when we are centering ourselves, we're going to ask the right questions and we're going to help find the right team and we're just going to have a better experience overall. Like I, you know, the data was so bad and so long lasting and so deeply impacting. I think we're going to be unwinding that one for a long time. We need long some time. analyses and I know there have been some done, but we need some analyses done where people come and say, hey, this is what really happened. And well, this is where we see. looked back at data and they found in other yeah. interesting, there've been studies that, that have been come out of there that have been yeah. really interesting, which, you know, I don't know how much time we really want to spend on that, but there, there's, there's been some positive information that has come out of there. Like one of the most interesting things, because people get very freaked out, like I said, about breast cancer and estrogen use. Yeah. Well, in that study, even with Premarin, which is not bioidentical, women who had a hysterectomy 
who did not have a uterus and did not need to use progesterone. I mean, this is a whole other conversation. Yeah, in general, we use progesterone to protect the uterus. I think there's other reasons why we can and should use progesterone. Mm -hmm. But these women were being conventionally treated. They didn't have a uterus. They only got Premarin. They had lower rates of breast cancer. So that just, I bring it up. That wasn't even told to people. Well, well, I mean, it was, right. This is, this is when you start really getting into the weeds and like dissecting some of the information. So the point is there that the story, that the simplified story that we often hear is really not nearly touching on the nuance that we understand that our bodies have. Hormones are chemical messengers. They're not, it's like food. It's not good or bad. Okay. They are chemical messengers. They talk to different parts of our body. I We talked about this earlier in the conversation now. There are estrogen receptors all over your body. So the estrogen receptor is just literally knocking on the door. You know, the estrogen is knocking on the door of the receptor. The receptor is opening that tissue or not, and it will have whatever effect it's going to have. It's not good or bad. It's having an effect. So it's not always what people think. Estrogen mm-hmm. isn't a thing that's bad that you should fear. What you should fear is not lack of knowledge, lack of conversation, people who aren't willing to have a little bit more of a deep conversation, answer questions, be okay with not agreeing with you. <laughs> Those are red yeah, flags to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Total red so. flags. Well, I think it's 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 important that we that we discuss these things as you as which is why we are having this conversation. But I think it would be good to maybe tell the people, I know these people that, because they ask me this, I get these DMs all the time yeah. and I have to refer to the specialist. I've got another yeah. book. There's a few people I refer to now. I have your book as well to send people Wonderful. to, which is really great. But people will may have, a, you know, they, they know I use BHRT. I'm quite open about that. BHRT, I should say. But what are, you know, what are the other alternatives? And what? let's have a conversation. Maybe, you know, why, why, why do you not like pellets, for example? Or they, do they concern you? What are other options? compounding pharmacy, the patches, gels, you mentioned a few things. And what about something like Premarin or are these options, you know, what, what should women know when they go to their doctor? What questions should they ask? They, I think they need to understand a couple of things. And I actually have a list in the book of like questions to ask, right? Yeah, that's what I wanted to, what are the questions to ask? You need to, first of all, understand your own personal medical history. Do, Do you have risk factors that you maybe didn't realize? And so this includes your family history if you have access to it. Because I I hear a lot of people come to me and say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so had a stroke and a this and a that, but they were alcoholic and they were this and they were that. And I'm like, okay, this is all true. However, this is also your family history. And Mm -hmm. again, I'm going to harken back to what we said in the beginning of the conversation. The number one killer of women is heart disease. Exactly. So it's great that you are living different than your mom or your grandma, but that doesn't mean that you are exempt from heart disease. So Mm-mm. we, so some of it is just knowing your personal history, knowing the family history, knowing other risk factors. If you've been pregnant, that is a stress test. So did you have gestational diabetes? Did you have preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders of the pregnancy? You're at much higher risk for getting mm-hmm. that later in life. So these are some of the things to think about. What are you bringing to the table? What are your priorities? What's really bothering you? Is the mm. worst thing for you right now that you're not sleeping and so you, you're not you're not thinking right and you're getting into trouble at work or feeling stressed? Okay, sleep, by the way, just so you know, because I brought it up for, that's the thing that I always try to attack first because if we don't get the sleep under control, the rest of it is really not gonna, it's just not gonna get better. And the other thing is I, I also get worried about people throwing too many things at you at once because mm. then you're not going to really know what's oh, really well, working. Mm-hmm. And also I find if I send you out with 40 different things, you're going to do none of them. You're exactly. going to do none of them. So I, I like to try to really get it down into bite-sized doable chunks and have more frequent follow-ups with people. So that's kind of my approach. And I think there isn't a way to answer specifically for people because Everybody's going to come to this yeah, with a with different a story. Different story. Mm-hmm. I have patients that have no reason why they can't use hormones, but they're weird about them. They feel nervous. They've heard things. Fine. You the expectation's going to... It's fine. To, I don't to care. Yeah. Do what you mm-hmm. want to do. I, I'm going to tell you something. Most of my patients who are eligible for hormones that don't want to use them in the beginning, ultimately are going to end up using them because they just work so much better. So for things like hot flashes and brain fog and sleep disruption, and like I said, the topical use... Really, the, the hormones are just 
far and away the most effective. There are some, look, I have some great botanicals that I love to use. French marine pine bark can work really well for hot flashes. Black cohosh has gotten a bad name. I disagree with the the takedowns and there have been very elegantly done studies in some of our most prestigious and authoritative journals like Menopause showing that the issue with black cohosh is bullshit. Excuse my French. It's, <laughs> it's you know, if you don't look, if you just go to rando pharmacy or rando Amazon store and buy, and buy stuff, yeah. no, that's a big no. So yeah. I'm very careful about specific vendors, just like I am with compounding pharmacists. I know exactly. my, I'm in LA, I'm lucky. I know my compounding pharmacists. I know them personally and professionally. I know what they do. I know what goes on in their pharmacies. I know the level of integrity. So I'm no fan of just click, click, click and get whatever. You, that's never a good idea. I think when people realize that they're going to have, like I said, a deeper and a wider toolkit, but a tour guide for that toolkit, then they then they feel a lot more confident about what they can get done. And, you know, I can't have an appointment with every person in America every day, and nor do I I want to, but but I I think I can at least get some guidelines out there so people can start reflecting on what's going to work best for them. And hopefully these are things that make sense. You know, I think the oh, lifestyle absolutely. stuff is in the, the book and we talk about yeah. it all the time. And that's, that's just, we have to be looking at our lifestyle. Stress management is beyond crazy the last two and a half years. It's horrible. It is horrible. And you, I just know from my 38 years in the field of mind, brain, body, you cannot eliminate the fact that your mind will change the way your hormones are functioning and there's all those so yes your body's going to go through menopause you're going to change but the way that your mind is being managed through that process in other words management managing stress that's so vital and it's not being part of the conversation for the last 40 years no. and it's one of the things that as we've become more biomedical everything's been lumped under, under that you know and I've, listening to how you explaining how you work with a patient that's sort of 15 minute checklist that you're doing with a prescription pad you spending time with your patient, yeah. which is why you can't see every single person in the right. world, which I'm sure everyone wants to come to, come to you now. <laughs> but that that's a different type of medicine that is currently being yes. practiced. But that's where, but that's where my holistic and traditional well, Ayurvedic really training me, and everything. Because mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily doing Ayurveda in the office, but but my but your principles, your philosophy yes, shifted exactly, exactly. And I'm looking at a whole person in front yep, of me. So important. That, and, and, you know, honestly, when we do that, and it's very, very hard in modern medicine, if you have an expectation and you've got to see this many and you've got productivity that you've got to meet and you're taking insurance, which I still do, which is crazy, it is really hard. It is really hard. And so I have a lot of compassion for my colleagues. But the reality is that people have got to take this into their own hands because they're not going to get what they want and what they need if they don't ask for it. And I've seen medicine change when the patients demand it. So exactly in, in the birth world, when I started in, in residency, when somebody came in with a doula and a birth plan, I mean, the eye rolling and the disrespect that was leveled at these people who really just wanted to have their birthright, a physiologic birth was intense. And it really impacted me because I was like, this doesn't seem right. This seems like it's just not nice. You know, and yeah. it's, creating, it's creating more problems, actually. Exactly. And I'll tell you something. What happened is patients stood up and said, no, we're not going to take this. Birth can become medicalized when it needs to be. Yeah. And thank God we have the tools to do exactly. so. Exactly. But we expect a certain level of respect as human beings that are coming in having this event and we want to be treated a certain way. And I watched my labor and delivery unit at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where I trained, completely transform and become very excited about how patient-centered and family-centered they were. They would never in a million years would have done that because studies were published. They did it because the patients demanded it. Oh, you see, that's the key. So if you, this is what you're doing now, you're equipping people with the, the tools. I mean, you can go yep. to your OBGYN yep. and you can say, okay. Oh my God, I'm got, about to be the most hated gynecologist in America. No, because <laughs> you'll be one of the most loved because it's going to be By a grant. And I, but, but, but you, you, your colleagues, I bet you if, you're, if they, they would actually say, hey, this is amazing. These patients are coming to me. It may be some males, the older males, and I, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm in anti, but I'm anti-patriarchy, exactly like you are, anti-how. Call the Midwife. You know that, that series, Call the Midwife? Yeah, Maybe yeah. One of my I favorites. I never watched it. I'm kind of like, ugh. 
That's a and, relaxing and you to probably, me. You probably <laughs> couldn't because of who you are, you know, what you are and what you do. But there's so many principles there that yeah. are fascinating for me from the mind perspective, which is why I enjoy it. And I know also I know one of the actresses is a friend of mine. So there's a little bit of a bias there. But if you just look at how in the hospitals in the 60s, as the, the, the males treated the women like they were infantile children and no respect and not asking them what yeah. they need. It was just yeah. all, you know, yeah. the symptom and the diagnosis and the, this is what we're going to do. And you don't know what's the best for you. That isn't right. It strips it strips the, the physician of their humanity too. Because exactly. the truth is that nobody goes into medicine for any other reason other than they really want to help people and they exactly. really Exactly. Otherwise, why would you and study for these years and exactly, go through what you go through? It's way too hard. And, exactly. and I think the system is really problematic. So, yes, you're right. I wrote the book exactly to create a guidebook and to create some communal guidelines for people. And the other thing that's going to happen is next year. So the book is coming out in October. And then next year in 2023, I'm going to launch a certification program for menopause boot camps. That's so people great. who want to, because I know you're going to address your community in a way that is unique that I can't address. Like I have the info and I can suggest ways that to help create a group experience and to help structure it. And here's the latest information. Here's what I do. And now you're going to go run with it. And this is a movement. I see this as a movement, Carol. Oh, absolutely. You know, so people can, a health coach or a therapist or a, just a person and in the RN, community, uh, whatever, a yoga yeah. teacher, mm, whatever, absolutely. can yeah. do the certification program and now bring it into the community and really create an opportunity and experience for their community to grow and to grow together. Mm. In a way that is healthful. It's I'm excited about that. I'm you know? excited that makes me too. Feel good. No, I, I'm very excited about that because it's 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 a, we've been speaking about change, and from the 50s to now, there's been a lot of change when it comes to women and women's rights, etc. We know that, but we still live in the dark ages. A, oh, yeah. a lot of the time, and so so even though you know just. AKA Roe versus Wade. I mean, how we have something like that in Ugh. this, uh, it's just complete, it's just, it's insane. That's all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know how to begin to verbalize which I, what I know you feel, but it has created a response. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. You need to, to go back to what it should be, but it's created this need from the patient level up, grassroots level up, which is what changes things, as you said That's yourself. That's exactly right. That's what I've always seen yeah. my whole life. People are very motivated to make uh -huh. a change and to get yeah. respect and honor that they deserve for childbirth, for menopause, and, and not, you know, your own rights on your own body. These yeah. are such vitally important components. You yeah. know, when someone just writes off menopause or doesn't, you know, just said, oh, it's just, you know, one of those things and doesn't respect that you could die of a heart attack or get Alzheimer's more than a male, it's just, un it's just not honoring of, of humanity. No, a hundred percent. And I think the other thing too is, you know, we we've lost our way in some ways in terms of respect for elders. You know, there's a reason a person That's who very lived good this point. long on the planet has learned some things. Exactly. And, you know, it would be great. Like we would like to share those things with you. <laughs> exactly. If you would like to listen, we would like to share. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we we have to take the respect, the wisdom of the elders because it. Uh, the wise, the the elder is the teacher, so is that, and, and the student. And that's what I've learned as I've got older, and not that we're old, but I mean, as I've got older, I've realized more and more, and I've actually for years, but seeing that I am, yes, I've got knowledge to contribute, but I'm also, I shift between being the teacher and the student. Yeah. And it's the more wise you get, the more you realize you need to be a student. A hundred percent. And okay, that's the so, curiosity part, right? Exactly. It's so interesting and fun to be learning. And hearing what other people have to say, you know, I mean, everybody has something to contribute. And so Absolutely. silencing silencing of specific groups is is not, not only is it just inhumane and, and unethical and amoral, but you're, you're missing out. You're, it, exactly. The party is less fun. The exactly. party is less fun. Exactly. Well, this has been enlightening and incredible, and I'm thrilled about your book. And I'm definitely going to get you back in studio with Lisa because I think I it would it. be fabulous. We'd have an incredible discussion and we'll dive a little deeper into details. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get lots of questions which will guide us. And, you know, people can get the book in the meantime because yes. the next time we tape will be in a few months' time. Yeah. So I'm very thrilled. Thank you for your time and your wisdom. Oh, thanks and for having me. It's been a great discussion. I feel like we've just touched the tip of the iceberg, know, which we have. I this know. is part one. Part two will be coming in the meantime, there is the book. So thank you so much, Beautiful. Suzanne. It's been incredibly enlightening and wonderful talking to you. Great to talk to you, Caroline. Thank you so much. Thank you.